It was uh, in World War II, at a time when England was under attack by the Nazi war machine, where the Blitz had devastated the city, where so many had lost their lives, where it wasn't at all clear that the war was going to end by an allied victory, but perhaps that Hitler and the Nazi machine would be uh, able to take over all of what we know as the more civilized world that C.S. Lewis wrote some rather interesting words that are worth pondering. The war, he said, creates absolutely no new situation. It simply aggravates the permanent human situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. That's a rather remarkable statement. I mean, how can you say that this is nothing different when London is being decimated and people you know are being killed, but what he's trying to say applies to us in our pandemic and the situations that we are experiencing. Uh, in one way, this is absolutely new. Something that we didn't think was gonna happen in one of the most uh, medically advanced, scientifically advanced, economically advanced nations that have ever existed on the world with all of the things that seem to be in place and then all of a sudden coming in a totally unexpected direction, we've come to realize how weak we are in a society that doesn't like to think about death, that pushes death out as no other, I think, time in history has ever been done so death happens away from us and we don't think about it or talk about it. All of a sudden we've had to deal with 66,000 people who've died in this particular equation, at least, and hundreds of thousands around the world. And it's a reminder that what we thought was protecting us isn't powerfully powerful enough to ultimately protect us. That we've always lived on a precipice. And how are we going to respond to that? Because God is the God who is always there, as C.S. Lewis went on to say, and talk about it, that life may be lived on a precipice, but there is a point of safety, and that is in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God that enables us to live in the hardest of times without fear. Somebody has wisely said that the only things that spread more rapidly than the coronavirus are fear and anger. And we're living in a time where we see both of those going on, rising fear and rising anger in different ways. And how do we put them together? Somebody else well said that adversity always changes us as Christ followers. It either changes us for the better or it changes us for the worst but it doesn't allow us to see, stay the same. We will be different coming out on the other side. All kinds of things will be different and we're puzzling over, but the issue is things are happening in us right now. And how are we going to respond? John is dealing with a group of Christians who've gone through a crisis of their own, nothing like the pandemic, nothing like World War II, but some people within what they thought was their Christian fellowship have defected. This is a small group of Christians in a pagan ocean who find themselves under attack and then some people they thought were members of them have left. They've not only left and defected physically, they've defected attacking the very truth of the gospel. And these people are kind of shaken by that. And Paul's constant concern in 1 John is to assure them, to help them to know. These things are written, he will say in chapter 5, verse 13, that you may know. And he wants us to live with confidence. And there's things about the confidence that he wants them to know that we need to know. Confidence about the ultimate future and, con and, and confidence about the immediate future. And that's what the passage we're going to look at in 1 John chapter 4 is about. So if you have your Bibles, take them, and we're going to uh, be looking at verses 17 to 21. But I want to uh, back up to verse 13 
and just to remind ourselves of some of the verses we looked at last week and uh, put that into context as we get to verse 17. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. And we've seen and bear witness or we've seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to trust the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he's not seen cannot love God whom he has not, uh, pardon me, he, whoever loves his brother whom he has seen, can, pardon I'll get this right yet. Whoever does not love God, <laughs> okay, I did pass first grade reading, but I'm having trouble this morning, obviously. Uh, whoever does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I'm sure you've noticed that people carry on conversations in different ways. There are some people when you talk to them and uh, their conversation, you can track it. It's logical. It's linear. It moves from one point to another. There's a kind of progress that you make your way through it. And uh, you can sort of say, well, this is where we began and we got there. And I, I see the conclusion and why you're reaching that. Now, it doesn't mean because it's logical that it's correct but it does mean that you can follow the course of the argument. Other people, when you talk to them, it's a very different thing. They're not uh, logical, linear logical. They're logical in their own way, but it's kind of intuitive. Uh, and they'll start, and then all of a sudden, they'll move over there and move over there. And you wonder how all of these pieces are fitting together. And then at the end, you'll see a, a brilliant insight, and you try to track. I'm not sure how you got there, but you're right. Now, the reason I mentioned that is that as you read the New Testament, you get people who are different in the way they do things. John, uh, pardon me, Paul. Paul's the logical person. He, he makes a case. When you read Paul, you go from this to this to this, and you begin to see how he's put it together. As a matter of fact, most of his books that fall into a, a bit very basic pattern, the first few chapters about what God has done. So here's what is now. Here's what you're to do. And with Paul, you can always figure out his books are pretty easy to outline and to see where he's going. John, though, John's a different matter. John's kind of intuitive. As a matter of fact, if you read the Gospel of John and you compare it to the three Gospels, you'll begin to discover there's differences. And John is pursuing themes in different ways through his book. Um, it, it's all logical. It all makes sense. But they're pictures rather than a kind of chronological order of the Lord's life. And then you get to 1 John. And 1 John, as you read it and you start following, and then all of a sudden John's here, and then he's there, and then he spirals back, and it doesn't sort of follow in that particular way. And then you come to the book of Revelation. Well, the book of Revelation is a whole different set. Paul could never have written Revelation. Obviously, the Spirit of God, I guess, could. But that's not who Paul is. And... John couldn't have written the book of Romans. God uses their difference. And we're different in different ways too. And all of that's good. But all that means is we come to John, we sometimes have to be prepared to kind of puzzle together certain pieces. And that's what we have in the section that we're going to look at this morning. Now, John has been talking about God's love and God's goodness. And let me remind you as... Uh, I've said there's these themes that run through it, these evidences 
a, a doctrinal evidence. What do you believe about Christ? A moral evidence. Are you obeying God's commands? Uh, uh, a relational. Are you loving one another? And he's been talking about the love of God. And now in these four verses, he's going to talk first of all about God's love giving us confidence. Confidence that is so great that we will be able to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus at the judgment and have confidence there. Now, look at verse 17. It has three parts to it. And if you're looking at my outline, it's wrong. So, first of all, verse 17 has this initial statement. By this is love perfected with us. Now that's his premise. And then there is a promise. I have product in the outline, and it should have been promise, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. And then there's a third statement. I've called it the product, but it's not, that's not a very good word for it. But I was in a P kind of alliteration thing, because as he is, so also are we in the world. So let's unravel some of that. First of all, the premise. The premise is, by this, going back to the previous verse, whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in love. By this is love perfected with us. Now, he's told us in those verses that God is love. That is his essential nature, says it in two places, verse 12 and verse 16. God is love. That is his essence. And so when God acts in love, he sends his son. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself to be a propitiation for our sins, the full payment. So the Christian life begins with that great truth. God is love, and that love has caused him to send his son to come in our place and on our behalf. We as Christians, the end of verse 16 says, abide in that love. We abide in God, and God is love, and God's love abides in us, and we abide in God. So love is kind of the environment, the atmosphere in which we as Christians live. Now, he says, in this, as we abide in God's love, in this, love is perfected. Now, that's the way the ESV translates it, and a number of others are. But that's not very helpful for us. Because the word perfected here has about it the idea of being completed, of reaching its goal. God's love caused him to send his son. It brought us into a relationship with him. We live in love, and now God's love is at work within us because God has a goal to accomplish in our lives. So I think the New International Version translates it, in this love is completed with us. The idea isn't that it's perfected, but that God's love begins to work and be an evidence in our lives. He's used that word a couple of other times back in chapter 2 and verse 4. We read about God's work in us. And he says, um, verse 5, I'm sorry, whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. It's brought to its goal. Now, what he's saying is, God's work in us is transformative. And one of the things when God's love is in us is it makes us obedient to him. It has an impact on our character. That is an evidence of God's work in us. In verse, seven, uh, in verse um, 12 of chapter 4, we have another use of that word. No one has ever seen God. If we love another, one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So what Paul is wanting, John is wanting us to understand is that God's love is not given to us 
as a kind of, so we're a swamp and we're taking it in. God's intention is that his love changes our standard of living so we become righteous and changes our relationships so we become loving. This abiding in God's love is intended to have love at work within us. Lord Jesus, when he was uh, praying just before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 17, verse 3, says, I have perfected the work that you have given me to do. And the word is completed the work you've given to me to do. In James chapter 2 and verse 22, James is writing about faith and works. And he says, and so faith is is completed, it reaches its goal through works. In other words, believing is where we begin, but God's love is intended to transform us. So the premise is that God's love is not just the sunlight in which we bathe and enjoy his love. God's love is his power at work within us to change us. And God's love is completed in us for a purpose. So notice the purpose that is given here in this, or the promise, so that we may have confidence before him at the judgment. The Lord Jesus is going to come for us. In chapter 3 and verse 2, we've already been told that by John. Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And the great hope of the Christian is the Lord Jesus is coming, and he's going to take us into his presence. And we are going to enjoy the blessing of being with him. But we are also going to come to the judgment seat. And both Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 tell us, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive the reward for the things done in this body, whether good or worthless. The issue at the judgment seat for a believer, this isn't the great white throne judgment at the end of time, isn't whether we're believers or not, it's for rewards and for the blessing and the approval of God upon us. And what God longs for us to do is to have confidence at his coming to be able to come into his presence and know that we're going to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, back in chapter 2, you may remember at the end of that chapter, he said in verse 28, but now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink in shame from him at his coming. So John is aware there's another response we could have in the presence of the Lord, but he longs for us to know the confidence because God's love is at work in us, enabling us both to obey his commands and live in a way that is worthy of him in loving our fellow brothers and sisters. And he's going to come back to that before the chapter is ended so that we can come with boldness, with confidence, as we live our lives before him. And John has also said back in chapter 3, something about the confidence that believers ought to be able to live with, because if you remember, he talked in this passage about that. Whenever our hearts condemn us, greater, pardon me, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So what John is promising is that we can know what it is to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus, aware of our shortcomings, aware of our failings. But if God's love has been transforming us so that we reach out to others, and this is not heroic acts, this is acts of love given to people in the places that God has called us, we can have confidence before him because, and this is a puzzling statement that ends verse 17, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, if you find that puzzling, 
So do nearly all the commentators who write on this book. What, what is John meaning? As he is, so are we in the world. Some take it to mean, as he is, so are we before God. Because we are seen in Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees us in Christ with all of the righteousness and all of the attributes and all of the things that the Lord has done for us, that we are seen in Christ and it's his righteousness, not ours, his faithfulness, not ours. And that is glorious true. We are in Christ. And when God sees us, he sees Christ first. Now, while that's true, I'm not sure that that's what Paul means because as he says, as he is, so are we in this world. And in a context of love, I think this comes closer to what was said in the great commandment that Jesus says, as I have loved you, love one another. This is the way all people will know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. So John wants us to understand in this particular place that the way in which we are like the Lord Jesus is as we live loving our brothers as the Lord Jesus loved us in this world, here and now. And so one of the great concerns of the Lord in his presence is going to be, are you loving your brothers? Has my love come into a dead sea and not gone out and left all of the kind of barrenness that you see when you go to the land of Israel around it or into a swamp? Or have you been a conduit of love to others as his love reaches its goal in you and through you? Now, verse 18 moves in a little bit different way. And it could be seen as he's still talking about the same thing, but I'm not quite sure. What he says is, now he talks directly about love. And he says, there is no fear in love. But perfect fear casts out, pardon me, perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected, made complete in love. Now there's something here that's saying that love and fear are incompatible. They contradict like oil and water. On one side there's fear and the other side is love. And there's a sense that that's obvious to us. Fear is part of life. Fear is the part of the way in which we live. We've experienced it in all kinds of different forms, even in the time in which we're living and the things that we're experiencing. Fear makes us self-protective. That's why people took all the toilet paper they could. That's why now the meat market is going to be the place where people pounce to make sure I need to look after myself. I, I need to care for myself. Love makes us self, uh, for, pardon me, fear makes us self-protective. It makes us self-focused. How is this going to affect me? At least the kind of fear he's talking about in that particular way. And, and fear causes us to either, as the old statement is, fight, take flight, or to freeze. And fear has that power within us. Into that comes the love of God and God's love and grace toward us in Christ. It's interesting in the Bible that the call fear not occurs so often in the Bible. I think I quoted somebody who'd counted 365 times saying there's one time for every day of the week in the Old Testament, fear not. But it's useful to think about that. And I was helped recently thinking about that to recognize that in the Old Testament and in our experience, the statement, don't be afraid, is almost always not a statement of rebuke, but a statement of compassion. It's a statement of care. I was thinking this morning as I was looking out and thinking about this and thinking about when I was teaching my grandkids to swim out in the pool. And if you've been a parent and you've tried to do that, or you can think of all kinds of other things you do, they instinctively pull back at that particular thing. And, and they look at it and they say, uh, Daddy, I'm afraid, or Grandpa, I'm afraid. And your response back, you don't need to be afraid. I'm with you. 
I'm with you. Fear not. It isn't, don't be afraid, which we really make them afraid. It's, don't be afraid. I, I remember at a, another stage where we got them in and they were paddling around, usually with the little things on their, on their arms or a thing, and then they'd get up on the side of the pool. Now, at a certain stage, they'll throw themselves at you. They, they don't know enough to be afraid. They just trust in you. And so you turn around and there's a little kid up in the air coming at you. Grandpa! And you grab them. But a little bit later, they're more aware of what's going on. And the same kids that threw themselves at you randomly are now there. And you've got to coax them off the edge. Don't be afraid. I've got you. It's, it's okay. God's love comes to us. Not to rebuke us. And not even, as it were, to remove our fears, but to assure us. Now, the fear that's in view here is the fear of punishment. It's not the fear of water. It's not the fear of the coronavirus. Fear has to do with punishment. And so what he's thinking about is as we live in the world, we can live in such a way fearful that if we get out of line, if we break the rules, God is going to judge us. But perfect love comes alongside our fears, comes alongside our brokenness, comes alongside our failing and said, I'm with you in this. I'm with you in this. Don't be afraid. I think some of the times I've been most afraid have been when I've seen a loved one. My wife, when she had her battle with breast cancer. My daughter, as she was going through the brain tumor that took her life. And, and all you could say is, honey, I'm with you. I'm not the Lord. I couldn't guarantee anything that was going to come on the other side. But perfect love casts out fear because the one whom we are trusting is the greater than any fear that we could accomplish. Perfect love casts out fear. That doesn't mean we're going to be without fears in our life, but it always means that we're going to be alongside the one who casts those fears into their proper perspective so that we can trust him. And then John is talking, too, about how this should be at present in our life. So verse 17, I think, talks about the ultimate fear of judgment. This talks about present fear as we live our lives in different ways. And then he comes back and says in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Now, if you were brought up like I was in the King James Version, you know that that verse is, reads in the King James, we love him because he first loved us. And that's true. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But as scholars discovered more things about the Greek text of the New Testament, they discovered that the oldest manuscripts we have, closest to the original, just simply read, we love, because he first loved us. In other words, the kind of love that he's talked about here comes because God's love precedes ours. He is the one who came into our life before we had any right or claim or merit before him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And God's love not only precedes our love, it produces love. Love for him. We love him because he first loved us. But we love in a way that John is talking about, love our brothers because he first loved us. And when we're loving our brothers, what we're doing is loving them because of the love of God through us and the love of God in them. We are loving God as we love them. And then John ends in a very different way. Both of these have been encouragements to confidence. And then suddenly, in verse 20, he talks about somebody who's full of bravado, full of claims, but he's a liar. And we're introduced, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. A number of times in John, he will say, that person's a liar. 
He'll say in John chapter 2 that the one who says that he knows God and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. He'll say the one who denies that Jesus has come into flesh is a liar. The one who doesn't love his brother is a liar. He can say all that he wants, but if he doesn't love God's people, he can't love the God whose people it is. We're not quite sure. Almost certainly the person involved here is one of these defectors who's left, oh, I still love God, but I don't believe Jesus is the son of God, and I don't believe that you're a special community who belong to him. And he was claiming that he could still love God at the same time rejecting Christ, rejecting God's standards of living, and at the same time having no interest in God's people. In this context, the opposite of love isn't hate as we would say it. I'm sure that this person would, oh, I don't hate them. I just don't have anything in common with them. I don't like being with them. And I don't believe they're anything special. So love takes many forms, but John says something interesting earlier in his book when he's describing it. He says, this is how we know that we've passed out of death into life. So how do you know that you're a Christian? Because we love the brothers. Isn't that an interesting statement? That's not the way that most of us would have finished that statement. I, I'm not sure that I would have finished it that. Oh, because you profess faith in Christ. No, John says, because the faith you professed in Christ has caused you to know God, abide in God, and love is the product of that. Then he says something else. Whoever does not love abides in death. Loving the brothers is a birth certificate. Not loving fellow Christians is a death notice. That's about as stark as you can put it when you're thinking through. And John says, kind of reversing the way we think, how, how can you love God whom you've not seen when you don't love your brother, someone who's claiming to be a child of God and is a child of God, someone whom God loves, if you do see him? Or as we might say, to somebody who's abusing one of your children, how can you say you love me when you're treating my child like that? I wasn't there, but you did this. You, anybody can say they love God because they, that God is not visible, and so you can claim this is showing love to him, and this is showing love to him, and this is showing love to them. All inventions of your mind and fabrications of yourself. The ground test is, do you love whom God loves? Fellow believers. And that's the way he is saying whether we know that we are of the truth or not of the truth, whether we're a liar, whether we're still in spiritual death, or that we are the children of God. And then just to underline this, he comes back to something that he has said over and over and over in the book. This is the command we have from him. The God who's invisible made himself visible in the person of Christ. And the way in which you showed that you loved God, the Father, was how you treated the Lord Jesus in the flesh. No one has seen God at any time. The one and only Son who's in the bosom of a Father, he's declared him. But Jesus will say later to the Jewish leaders, how can you say you love God when you hate me? And now Jesus is saying the same thing, or pardon me, John is saying the same thing. How can you say you love God if you don't love his people, and it's the Lord's command for us, and we live under that command. John is just reminding us that that's our call. We live in a time of physical distancing. I think the term social distancing is wrong. I know we're not going to change it. What we talk about a social distancing isn't social distancing, it's physical distancing. Christians cannot be engaged in social distancing. It's harder when there's physical distancing to have social distancing. But we need, if we love Christ, to be figuring out ways in which we close the distance. When we can't do it physically, is no excuse for not doing it personally. And we have various ways. Thankfully, we've got technology in our hands that no other generation had. And so one of the things as we think about this 
is that God wants us to live with confidence that when we stand in his presence, we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we often think that the people will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, are the great preachers and the celebrity theologians and all of these others, or even pastors of local churches. But the Lord says it will be in whom love has been demonstrated, who's demonstrated the presence of God by acts of love and deeds of love. And confidence is the product of Christ-likeness. And Christ-likeness is seen in caring for others. And we can live with confidence in the present because we know that in our fears, the Lord is coming alongside us. And we also know that he has promised to keep us and hold us. And then we move to the reality of the call is on us, the command of our Savior in our rears. Love one another. This is the way people will know that you are my disciples. One of the reasons, intriguingly, we're not meeting is out of love for one another and love for outsiders as well. But the love that causes us not to meet is also the love that causes us to reach. May that be something you do in a new and fresh way this week. Well, in the midst of all of the certainties, one of the things that's true is celebrated in the song we're going to conclude with. There's a lot of things that we don't know, but what we do know is this. He will hold us fast, firm in his hand, and we can celebrate that truth, and that gives us the confidence to love one another and to love others for his glory and for their good.